It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, out of respect for the Legislature, will the Premier immediately halt all the hydro vanity ads until the Speaker has ruled on the case uh, uh, for contempt? Uh, will the Premier please answer? Government House Leader. Attorney General. Sorry. Uh, uh, speaker, um, uh, again, this matter is, as you know, is uh, uh, before you. Uh, this uh, this matter has been referred to you, uh, uh, and Speaker, and and so, uh, of course, we we await our, our ruling. Speaker, on this side of the, uh, on this side of the government, uh, we are focused in making sure that we bring meaningful relief to the people of Ontario, that we reduce the hydro rates by 25 percent. That's what the government is doing. It's a very important policy. Obviously, the opposition um, is only engaged in distraction because, Speaker, they have no plan. They are actually really confused. And given they have no plan, they're relying on, on procedural tactics, denying opportunity for Ontarians to have access uh, to important information that will ensure that. Uh, they know exactly the kind of steps the, the provincial government is taking, and that is to reduce yes, their hydro rates by 25 percent. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, the issue here is about ads paid for by taxpayers that are used for partisan purposes. Yesterday, the minister said the following, I am very pleased to rise and talk about when we're going to be bringing forward the legislation this spring to enact the Liberal Hydro Scheme. Clearly, the legislation is coming forward, and the minister is making a mockery of this legislature and its members as he runs self-congratulatory ads paid for by taxpayers. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier stop her re-election campaigning and using taxpayer resources to do it? It's wrong, and the Premier won't do it. We're getting close. Well, Speaker, Mr. I think the member opposite is confused. I think he still thinks that he's sitting in the Harper government where they ran ads after ads on, on the Harper's economic action plan, and he kept touting, uh, touting about that. Speaker, on this side of the House, this government has taken some very concrete measure in making sure that we have one of the strongest pieces of legislation when it comes to government, uh, government advertising. Speaker. So, Speaker, our government has strengthened legislation to provide a clear definition of partisan advertising, requiring the government to submit a preliminary version of the ad to the Auditor General for review and reinforce rules around government advertising during general elections. Speaker, under our legislation, the government ad can't include the name, the voice or image of a member of the Executive Council or a member of the Assembly, including the name or logo of a party, or directly identify and criticize a recognized party or member of the Assembly. The members yes, opposite, sir. of course, remember the good old Harris days where they were able to do that, Speaker. We have passed legislation and that will not be allowed in Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The Minister quotes the and references the Auditor General. The Auditor General's powers have been stripped, and she has said on the record last Friday that she wouldn't have supported these. It's simply a pat on the back. So, Mr. Speaker, I will continue. The Minister of Energy said they will spend under $1 million on both radio ads and social media ads, but there will be more to come. So the question everyone asks, how much more? How many millions is this government going to spend of hard-earned taxpayer dollars for their own partisan purposes? So, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Do you really think it's right to use taxpayer dollars to run partisan ads? It's wrong. Stop it. Everyone in Ontario seeks Before I, uh, before I continue, before I continue, I'm going to make an observation, and then we'll deal with it uh, accordingly. When someone is asking a question, I'm hearing heckling from the same side. When somebody is answering, I'm hearing heckling from the same side, and that's not appropriate either way. When I'm trying to bring decorum to the place, and it doesn't do anything but elevate the problem, so. That said, I would ask you to also remind the leader that you speak to the chair, please, directly. Premier. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, the Ontario government has a response. If someone decides that they're going to test me, so I'm tested. The member from uh, Nepean Carlton is warned. We are now in warnings. Carry on. Speaker, the government has a responsibility to inform Ontarians and to make sure that we raise awareness and communicate. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. I think, Speaker, it's important that we communicate important vital information to Ontarians. We know that uh, people's hydro bills has, a, has been a serious concern for Ontarians. It is important, Speaker, that they know what the government plan is. And, Speaker, we have a plan. We are going to be cutting the hydro uh, electricity rates by 25 percent. What Ontarians are asking is the official opposition, what is your plan? The reason the opposition, Speaker, is so worked up about a procedural matter is because they have no plan. The member from Chatham Kent Essex is warned. The member from Oxford is warned. Finish, please. One Spe speaker, their plan is a blank piece of paper, and that's what Ontarians are asking, and they have no information on that. Thank you. New question. Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Since I can't get an answer on the taxpayer funded Liberal election ads, I'm going to ask another question. And that is, I'm going to read a quote from Mark Nantis, the president of the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association. And he said, the Ontario government appears to do nothing to address the climate of investment uncertainty related to what has been their number one request, to deal with electricity rates that can be as high as two to three times higher in Ontario in competing auto jurisdictions. These manufacturer leaders says the government has done nothing when it comes to hydro. Mr. Speaker, is this government going to risk the jobs of over 124,000 people employed in auto manufacturing in Ontario? Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The Minister of Municipal Affairs is warned. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Energy is going to want to comment on uh, on this question in the supplementary. But, but, Mr. Speaker, I want to just say that um, the record amounts of investment that we have seen in the auto industry over the last six months, Mr. Speaker, really speak to the reality that the auto sector in Ontario is extremely important. It's extremely strong, and, Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to support it. We are going to continue to work with uh, with uh, the auto sector and not just the uh, not just the, uh, the, uh, the plants, Mr. Speaker, but the supply chain, making sure, that, making sure that that supply chain is in place and that it's strong, making sure that we have the highly educated workforce that we need to be innovating in the auto sector, Mr. Speaker. You know, the whole issue around automated vehicles and artificial intelligence, that's very Answer. much the cutting edge. That's, that's the, uh, the frontier of the auto sector. That's why we're investing in those technologies, Mr. Speaker, and we are doing very well in terms of North American investment in the auto sector. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Premier. The Premier says that the government's helping the auto sector, but the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association says their number one request about protecting these jobs in Ontario is being ignored. So the facts seem to be very different than what the Premier is suggesting. Now let me ask another question, Mr. Speaker. The Liberal Caucus Q&A that was given out to Liberal members before their hydro scheme, question 29 said, will this rate decrease apply to currently links, hospitals and schools? And Mr. Speaker, you know what the answer is? No. There's not going to be relief. Really. Mr. Speaker, why won't this scheme keep curling clubs and hockey rinks open? We're seeing the small towns across Ontario, they can barely keep these rinks, these recreational services open. Hospitals are struggling. Public institutions are struggling because of the Liberal hydro crisis. So my question to the Premier is when can we question? expect relief for hockey rinks, curling rinks? When can we expect relief for hospitals and schools? Thank you. They're struggling with these hydro increases. 
Mr. Speaker, you know, I understand, I understand the intensity behind the question that's coming from the Leader of the, uh, the Opposition because, Mr. Speaker, in fact, we have a plan that is going to reduce people's electricity bills across the province. We understand that electricity bills have been a burden for people, Mr. Speaker, and we are taking action. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition seems to suggest that he supports our plan, but he thinks that we should do more, Mr. Speaker, and that's, that's fine. We're going to continue to work with municipalities, we'll continue to work with people across the province, with businesses. The Minister of Energy is well aware, Mr. Speaker, that there are, there are groups who are still Member looking to Prince us and Edward saying, Hastings well, you know, how is this going to work for us? But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is people in Ontario will see a 25 per cent reduction in their home electricity bills come the summer, Mr. Speaker. That's something that I hope the Leader of the Opposition is tacitly saying he's Thank supporting. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The Premier says that we should that, that I said we should do more. Well, sh I, I absolutely agree. We need to do more by not paying the Hydro One CEO $4 million a year. We need to do more by stop signing these ridiculous green energy contracts. 1,100 more proceeded when we don't need it. Minister of Transportation is more. Pennsylvania, in Ohio, New York, this government's continuing to charge Ontarians to give energy away, and we're spilling water power. I want them to stop that. Absolutely, we have to do more. Our hospitals can't afford it. Our small businesses can't afford it. Our seniors can't afford it. This isn't enough. This is a bandage on a bullet wound that this government created. They're borrowing money to pay for their own mistakes, and Ontarians have had enough of it. So my question is, my question for the Premier is, when can we have real relief? When can we see these contracts stop being signed? Thank you. When can we see relief on hydro seals? Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is warned. And there's a couple others here that I was looking at. I wasn't quite sure who. <laughs> Took away my poker face. But it'll still happen. Premier. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to rise and talk about our plan that is going to help every family, every small business, and every farm in this province, Mr. Speaker. And while they stand up and yell and shake their fists, Mr. Speaker, they actually have no plan. Absolutely no plan, Mr. Speaker. Five point plan. You're ignoring it. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is named. The member might not have known it, but he was very close to being expelled. That kind of action shall not be tolerated in this House. That goes for anybody. That's disrespectful, and I won't tolerate it. Minister. So I know it's a very touchy subject for them, Mr. Speaker, but they have no plan. The member even stood up to the media and laughed when asked his, where was his plan. He said, in the policy department, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> our, Mr. Speaker, our plan bringing forward 25 percent. Member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound is warned. You have a wrap up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our plan will deliver results for Ontario families, businesses, and farms. They don't have one. We have one, Mr. Speaker, and it's working. Thank you. Thank you. Question the leader of the third party. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Hospitals all across Ontario have been facing huge hydro bill increases on top of Liberal budget freezes and cuts. Last week, it was revealed that the Sioux Area Hospital in Sault Ste. Marie saw nearly a million 
dollar increase to its hydro bills Whoa. in just four short years. Wow. Since she won't release her plan, can the Premier tell Sioux residents who are now facing cuts to frontline health care if her $40 billion borrowing scheme will help the Sioux Area Hospital? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know the uh, member from the, the leader from the third party is talking about the Sioux Area Hospital. So let's be clear about what the Sioux Area Hospital had to do after their media announcement. The Sioux Area Hospital said that they have not made decisions directly tied to increases in electricity rates, and that increases have not resulted in layoffs, Mr. Speaker. And let's also talk about hospitals. They're also eligible, Mr. Speaker for a range of programs like the Save on Energy uh, audit and retrofit uh, fit initiatives to help lower their bills by becoming more energy efficient. For example, um, Sudbury Health Sciences North got more than $275,000 uh, for help in energy efficiency upgrades, and now they're saving over $500,000 each year in energy costs, Answer. Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, their Fair Hydro plan will also help hospitals see a modest reduction between 2 and 4 percent as well. Well, Mr. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, it's not just Northern hospitals that are suffering. Right here in Toronto, access to information documents show that the Mount Sinai Health System saw a 45 percent increase Whoa. in hydro bills wow. between 2010 and 2015. That's nearly $1.5 million, Speaker, that is not going to support frontline health care that Toronto of housing is is depend on. If she refuses to release the details of her phantom plan, Speaker, can the Premier at least tell Mount, Mount, Mount Sinai Health System if she plans to help them out with some relief? Minister, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we did help Sinai Health Care System out last year by giving them a, an additional seven million dollars to their budget last year. 2.1% increase in their operating budget, Mr. Speaker, and I think, you know, it bears repeating. I know that my colleague, uh, the Minister of Energy, uh, quoted uh, from the CEO of the Sioux Hospital, but I think it's really important that we revisit that because the leader of the third party has a tendency, Mr. Speaker, to visit, ho visit hospitals without having those important conversations first with the board, with the CEO. And the hospital, after her visit to Sault Ste. Marie, the hospital was forced to go out publicly on the record and say that while electricity yes, costs have risen over the past five years, those increases have not resulted in any layoffs at that hospital, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. If the Premier won't tell the Sioux Area Hospital or the Mount Sinai Health System if they're going to see some relief under the Phantom Plan, perhaps she could enlighten the University Health Network, which has seen its hydro bills go up by over $6 million in six years. Or how about Toronto East General Hospital, speaker, which saw a 67 percent increase Whoa. in six years. Speaker. The Premier needs to show Ontarians that she is serious about real relief and not just buying some support for the Liberal Party ahead of the next election. Will she release the details of her plan? Speaker? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to inform the legislature and the public that last year we provided an increase to University Health Network of their operating budget of $9.5 million, Mr. Speaker. And, and I need to go back to Sault Ste. Marie, Mr. Speaker, because it's a tremendous hospital providing excellent care to the individuals that rely on it. And so the Sioux Hospital, the second part of their public declaration, and no, we did not ask them to do this. They felt compelled because of the misinformation that had been provided. The Sioux Hospital said that, quote, it has not made decisions directly tied to the increase in electricity rates and that there are no planned layoffs of frontline staff at Sioux Hospital. Yes, New question, the leader of the third party. Questions, uh, also for the uh, Premier uh, Speaker. Uh, I have to say it's sad that hospitals that get a little bit of money after years of freezes are having to use that to fill a hole in 
in their budgets that the Liberal Hydro Plan has left them with, Speaker. That's a real sad situation, when it should be going to frontline care. The Premier's heard the facts from Sault Ste. Marie, from Toronto. Perhaps that's not enough. Let's try London. At London Health Sciences, which is made up of uh, several uh, sites, access to information documents reveal that hydro consumption dropped by 13 per cent over the same six-year period, that hydro bills went up by 29 per cent. Does the Premier not understand how this would worry Londoners who depend on good quality care at their hospitals? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, we could go on all day because I'm happy to report that for London Health Sciences Centre, we increased their operating budget last year by over $17 million. Oh! So you've got your list, I've got my list, and I'm happy to continue to report, Mr. Speaker, that the investments that we've made, the investments that they voted against, Mr. Speaker, in the last budget, there, our annual increase to hospital budgets was close to 3 per cent. It includes all of the hospitals that the member opposite, that the leader of the third party is referencing. And I have to say, Mr. Speaker, in the three years that almost that I've been Minister of Health, I have not had Answer. a single hospital board or CEO come to me and wow. say that the component of their budget, that roughly 1% that goes towards electricity, has been a burden to them. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker. Windsor Regional Hospital's Met Campus saw a 49 per cent increase in their hydro bills in the five years between 2011 and 2016. What does the Premier have to say to the people in Windsor, Speaker, who know that not only is she lining the pockets of her banker friends with her $40 billion phantom plan, but she's also offering hospitals in Windsor nothing at all to deal with the problems that they've created in the electricity system. I think I should have provided this list in advance to the member opposite because she'd be a little bit more careful in the hospitals that she chooses because again Mr. Speaker Windsor Regional Hospital I'm happy to report that they received more than a 3% increase to their budget and again 9.9 .9 million dollars more to that hospital corporation last year and we continue to make these important investments investments that routinely and regularly and consistently that party has voted against when we added 345 $5 million to the operating budgets of hospitals in the budget last year. They voted against those investments. When we added an additional $140 million last fall to support those hospitals, those are important. They're critical investments, and they're investments that we take very seriously to ensure that our hospitals are able to manage, they are able to provide the highest quality of care that they do in this Thank province, you. Mr. Speaker. Final supplement. Speaker, I don't know what planet this minister is on. We've got hallway medicine happening in every hospital virtually across this province. Four years of frozen funding, one percent increase in the last budget. They have not only made a mess of our electricity system, Speaker, they have made a mess of our hospital system, and every patient in Ontario that deals with hallway medicine experiences that each and every day in the province of Ontario. But look, I'm going to talk about my own hometown hospitals in Hamilton. St. Joe's electricity costs doubled from $3.98 million to $8.15 million, an increase of 105 per cent between 2010 and 2016. 105 per cent. Maybe the Premier can tell us, since she won't release Question. details of her phantom plan, will that plan actually deal with this rising hydro costs, the soaring electricity bills in our hospitals across the province. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm glad. I think this is the last supplementary because <laughs> I'm embarrassed to report. While I'm embarrassed for the, the member, the leader of the third party, because I think Hamilton. it's appropriate that this be the last supplementary on this for now.
Finish, Minister. Well, I'm happy to listen to the facts, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. So, Hamilton Health Sciences Corporation, I'm pleased to report to the Legislature that last year we provided an increase of 3.6 per cent to that corporation, $29.4 million more dollars to their operating budget than the previous year. Mr. Thank you. New question, the member from Nepean Carlton. My question is to the Premier. Last week I visited SunTech Greenhouses with owner Bob Mitchell. Bob's a good man. He is a proud farmer, and he is known in Ottawa for his little miracles in Manitick. But between the Liberal Green Energy Tax, the eight Stop. No, 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 no. Start the, the leader of the third party is warned. Please finish. The HST, the new carbon tax, the Liberal Green Energy tax, and all the waste in energy from cancelled gas plants to power lines to nowhere mean that Bob's cucumbers and his tomatoes are 30 per cent more expensive than his, Ameri than his Mexican counterparts. He couldn't even run his lights this past winter to grow his beefsteak tomatoes. Liberal energy policy is doing its best to put Bob out of business. And What does he hear from the Liberal government? He hears from the PA of the Minister of Energy, who says it's humidity, not energy prices, that are forcing. Uh, greenhouses down south. Bob Question. and every other greenhouse grower in Ontario deserves an answer from this government. Will they phase in the burden Thank of the you. cap and trade, and will they ensure that these, uh, these farmers have an ability to make their profits? I would ask the member to sit when I stand. Oh, Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do want to thank the uh, member for that question because the greenhouse growers uh, um, throughout the province are an important part of our, uh, our, our economy, Mr. Speaker. I know the Minister of Agriculture does great work with them as well, and we met with them uh, several times, Mr. Speaker, to talk about what are the programs that are out there, Mr. Speaker, that actually help our greenhouse growers. And, Mr. Speaker, the greenhouse growers were thrilled, Mr. Speaker. They were thrilled with the fact that we actually introduced the ICI program and dropped it from three megawatts mr speaker to 1 megawatts mr speaker because many of those uh, greenhouse growers they actually can now apply and qualify for the ICI program mr speaker which will allow them allow the greenhouse growers and any other business that is uh, part of the ICI program drop their bills by up to one third, Mr. Speaker. Wow. And that is significant many, for many of these greenhouse growers right across the province and many of those companies as well that can benefit from the yes, ICI sir. program. And you know what, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Fair Hydro Plan dropped that even further from one megawatt to 500 kilowatts Thank so you. more businesses can apply. Supplementary. Well, that's simply not true. That's, that's a counter to everything that Bob Mitchell told me. I met with Dwight Foster of North Gore Grains. He owns the largest grain elevator operation in eastern Ontario, and Fernando Medeiros of Carlton Mushrooms. What you're telling me today is simply not true. Like SunTech, all of them produce quality food. They employ dozens, if not hundreds, of people, but the Liberal energy policies of this government over the past decade are continuing to hurt them. The Liberal PA to energy was clearly told by Jim Demina, President and CEO of Red Sun Farms, last week, humidity, that's not a deal breaker. The cost of energy is a deal breaker. Will the Premier Question. stop handing out glossy flyers, self congratulating yourself, and actually do something for the grain Thank growers you. of this province and the. And the you. Okay. You see the please? There's two issues in what just happened. The second time I have to tell the member when I stand, you sit. If that's the case, you may be costing your party a question because I can skip a rotation if it continues. Number two, you were dangerously close to making an accusation that is not permissible and unparliamentary. I would remind the members, all members, that you cannot do indirectly what you cannot do directly. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know they don't like to hear the fact that the ICI program actually lowers bills by a third, but that is true, Mr. Speaker. And there are thousands of businesses that are actually taking this government up 
and doing just that. But, Mr. Speaker, the opposition uh, is overlooking some Remember great examples Stormont, of greenhouses that are choosing to base their future right here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I'm particularly pleased with the recent announcement that uh, Greenhell Produces plan to invest up to $100 million, Mr. Speaker, to develop yeah, $100 million to develop a 100-acre greenhouse in Chatham-Kent, adding up to 300 jobs in this province, Mr. Speaker. That is just one example of many, Mr. Speaker, and we're continuing through the Minister of Economic Development and Growth, through the great work of the Minister of Agriculture, and through the great work and leadership of this Premier to make sure that we continue to build this province up and make us the most competitive in North America. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Elite private clinics have been operating under this government nose for years. Speaker, when wealthy people can pay thousands of dollars to jump the queue, everyone else waits longer for their care. It hurts seniors, it hurts patients, it hurts families, and it violates the principle of the Canada Health Act. The health minister says that he has been monitoring these private clinics. He says he's been watching them very closely, and I thank him for that. I think it's important work. Will the Premier release the records of these investigations of private clinics, or will she keep them secret? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm, uh, I'm, glad, I'm happy to have this question again today. Uh, and I'm happy to re reiterate on behalf of this government our absolute commitment to Medicare, to universal health care, to the Canada Health Act, and the work that we do, that I do on a daily basis to ensure that the principles behind those important uh, acts and pieces of legislation that they are upheld in this province. And as I mentioned uh, yesterday, it was our government, it was not a previous government, it was our government in 2004 that first and substantially and emphatically put in place measures to uh, ensure that those principles were upheld, introducing legislation in 2004 that made it illegal for any person or entity to charge or accept any benefit for an insurance Answer. service in addition to the amount that is paid by OHIP, and I'm happy to go into more details in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. So we all remember that the question is, will you release the records? Speaker, we know that cutting wait times for every family, every seniors, and every patient, but instead, the Liberal government is telling people to pay up or wait longer. Today, we have private clinics charging thousands of dollars to allow people to jump the queue. We have for-profit companies charging up to $100 for a telemedicine appointment. We have people in pain who feel that they have no choice but to pay up because they cannot suffer the wait time any longer for the care that they need. The Premier can do the right thing for all of those people, the right thing for our public health care. She can release those records of the monitoring of private clinics in Ontario. Premier, will you do the right thing? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, Ontario has the and I'm referencing these because they were referenced by the member opposite yesterday, her concern about wait times, and again today. Ontario has the shortest wait time in the country for a CAT scan. Ontario has the shortest wait time in the country for an ultrasound. Ontario has the shortest wait time in the country for an MRI. Ontario, the wait time for a PET scan is in the order of four to five days working days, Mr. Speaker, and that time is actually going to likely get even quicker for the residents of Sudbury once in a year's time they have a fully operational PET scanner yeah. at their local hospital, Mr. Speaker. But it is important that we monitor and ensure that those principles I described earlier are upheld. And in 2004, we also made it illegal for any person to Answer. pay, charge, or receive payment to receive special or expedited access to the Medicare system, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Northumberland, Point U.S. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is the Minister of Education. Oh, Minister, we know the importance of ensuring students receive the best possible education. We are illustrating that this is a top priority by making important investments in our education system. Our, our students consistently rank among the best in national and international student achievement results, and 71 percent of elementary students are meeting or exceeding the provincial standard in reading, writing, and math. 
up by 17 percent, 17 percentage points since 2003. Minister, we all know that how committed our government is to helping our kids become lifelong learners because the claim of because the claim of the opposition. Like for example, like building new schools in my riding from Port Hope, Coburg, Brighton, Cramie, and Brighton. Wow. Our speaker, through you to the minister, can you tell us more about the investment we made in our schools and how it's been thank you. benefiting our students? Minister thank of Education. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to say thank you to the member from Northumberland, Quinty West, Good for guy. this question. The member has been a terrific advocate for his community, and I've had the pleasure of speaking with him on a number of occasions on educational issues. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we know and understand the importance of a high-quality, well-rounded education for Ontario students. And this is why, since 2003, we've increased education funding to $22.9 billion, an increase of 59 per cent. We've also increased per-pupil funding by more than $4,500 to $11,709, an increase of 63 per cent despite declining enrollment. Wow. After inheriting an education system in disrepair, Ontario is Answer. now an international leader in education. Because of our investments, Mr. Speaker, we also have more students graduating today than at any other. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Minister. We are extremely proud to hear how our investments are helping students achieve their best in the classroom. I know the importance of supporting school boards in ensuring that funding goes to programs and services that directly benefit students. Over the past several years, I know that there is a lot of claims about our investments and commitment to our schools. Can the minister please provide the House with examples how our investment are helping schools across Ontario? You, Mr. Speaker, I want to say thanks again to the member from Northumberland, Quinty West, for his question. And I'm happy to provide examples of how we are continuing to support our education system. And this includes the nearly 810 new schools and more than 780 additions and renovations. Mr. Speaker, I was disappointed last week that the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek stood in this House and made accusations with no evidence. This creates more division in our communities, not solutions. Although the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek corrected his record Thank while you. blaming his leader's office, I would like to remind the House that in Hamilton East Stony Creek, we've invested in eight new and improved schools. And here is the proof. $8.9 million to build a new St. Gabriel Catholic Elementary School, $11.6 million to build a new East End School, $14.4 million to build a new Summit Park School, $925,000 to build an addition to Thank Cardinal you. Newman. New question. The member from Simcoe Gray. Okay, well, next speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, speaker, last week the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound and I toured Meaford Hospital, where the community is very concerned about the possible loss of surgical services with the closure of their single operating room. The minister's failure to properly fund rural hospitals is forcing the closure of operating rooms not only in Meaford, but also in Markdale and Southampton. If the government removes surgery at Meaford Hospital, the facility could become nothing more than an ambulatory care centre, or worse, Mr. Speaker, it could close. Speaker, what is the minister going to do to prevent the removal of surgical services at Meaford Hospital and other rural hospitals like it? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question, and my staff and the ministry are working uh, with, uh, with Meaford as well as the uh, larger corporation to look specifically at this issue. And I have to say, I appreciate it. I saw the newspaper article of the visit that the opposition members uh, made, and it, uh, it alerted me further to some of the discussion that was going on. Of course, no decisions have been made. Nothing has been approved uh, by the LIN. This hasn't been mandated by the LIN, nor has it been mandated by the ministry. It has to be approved by the LIN, has to be approved by the ministry. So we're always looking at ways that we can uh, accommodate uh, local reactions and the challenges that might be faced uh, by particularly small community hospitals like the community hospital that I was born into, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, deeply just how important yes, hospitals like Meaford Hospital are to the local community for a whole variety of reasons. We're working closely to see what we can do in this case. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Bruce Gray, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, Greybury's Health Services is held up as a model of amalgamated community hospitals, and yet, despite its best efforts, is struggling to deliver patient care because of your waste and mismanagement. Yeah. The closure of surgical sites in any rural community means people will be forced to travel out of town to get care. I trust I don't have to remind you that transportation is almost non-existent in rural Ontario, so how are all those constituents, especially low-income families and seniors, supposed to get there and back home? Minister, your government's callous waste and mismanagement is potentially going to harm the people of Meaford and area. Will you commit today, not just talk about it, will you commit today to fixing the funding formula so that hospitals like Meaford's can continue to provide care close to home in the future and save all this angst in the, in the community? Thank you. Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm working hard, and the Ministry of Health is working hard uh, with our uh, small towns, with local community hospitals, to help them address uh, the unique challenges that they might be facing. The uh, member opposite uh, only needs to talk to his colleague, a couple of chairs uh, beside him, to, uh, to understand fully what we were able to do in Leamington, where that hospital was considering closing its obstetrics uh, ward, Mr. Speaker. And we, able, we were able to get involved and reverse that decision, and I would hazard a guess that their obstetrics ward and the midwives that have been brought into that, it's probably a stronger service than that uh, hospital and that community has seen in a long, long time. Or in Quinty Health care in the hospital in, in Brockville, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, where we have worked hard to—not Brockville, Bill. Trenton, Bill. Trenton. and the member, the member has reminded me of his hard work yes, to be able to ensure that services remain. Lastly, I'll just ask the member uh, opposite, I hope he'll join me when shortly we do have the groundbreaking for his brand Thank you. new hospital in Markham, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from London, Fanshawe. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Last week, I had a town hall on long-term care in my riding. One of my constituents told me she was forced to take her father out of the hospital, and he's been living in a hospital bed in her living room. Minister, she has missed so much work, she isn't sure she has a job to go back to. And she is currently unable to pay her mortgage and her hydro bills because her father needs daily care. Minister, you have failed my constituents, and I want to know exactly what are you doing for the 26,500 seniors and their families who are languishing on waiting lists, waiting for a long-term care bed? Thank you. Health, long -term care. Well, Mr. Mr. Please, you see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate this question as well, and I know that the, I, I'm not familiar with this specific case. I'm happy to discuss it. However, with the uh, member opposite, should she? Uh, wish that. But, Mr. Speaker, our investments in, in long-term care, and not just long-term care, because it's important that we look at this holistically, hospital investments for those that require that, home care investments as well. We've increased the home care budget year after year. I think we're in the fourth year now of a 5 percent increase in that budget. But we've built, since coming into office, 10,000 new long-term care beds, Mr. Speaker. We've redeveloped already, or in the process of redeveloping, 13,000, well on our way to our commitment of 30,000 beds redeveloped by 2025, Mr. Speaker. But there are challenges, and often when you drill yes, down to the individual case, and when we are made aware, uh, sometimes we have the ability, working with all our stakeholders and partners, to make a difference Thank in you. that instance. Supplementary. Minister, the growing demand for long-term care beds has not just come up out of the blue. Experts have warned this government for more than 10 decades. Now there are 26,500 seniors and their families caught up in cycles of stress, poverty and loss of dignity. The same experts have also told you that the wait list will double in six years to 50,000 people. Minister, you have failed to act. Will you commit to ensuring that every senior has access to a long-term care bed when they need it? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, among the uh, more than 10,000 long-term care beds that we've added uh, since coming into office, Mr. Speaker, include uh, 192 new beds at the Homewood Corporation in London, 160 new beds at People Care in London, Mr. Speaker, 192 new beds at Henley Place Limited in London, Mr. Speaker, 32 beds at Chateau Gardens in London, and we are also well on our way to redeveloping many, many beds uh, in London as well. At, 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 
in excess of 500 easily. Shadow Gardens, Extenda Care, Versa Care, Dearness Home, McCormick Home, McGarrow Place, Kensington Village, uh, all located in the London region, Mr. Speaker, probably in London, in itself. London itself. Certainly, uh, we are making significant investments, including Answer. the members' own riding and, uh, and city, Mr. Speaker. Yep. Thank you. New question, the member from Kingston and the Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to stand in this House to recognize that today is International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and direct my Minister, question please. to the Minister responsible for anti-racism. Speaker, approximately one year ago, the Anti-Racism Directorate was established and the Minister was appointed by our Premier with a mandate to address racism in all its forms, with a focus on systemic racism. Speaker, regrettably, systemic racism is still very deeply entrenched in our day-to-day -day lives. We have seen it in many of our communities, such as the vandalism in the mosque in Kingston and the Islands a couple of years ago. Racism continues to negatively impact people in our province every single day. This is unacceptable and must be addressed. It is important that our government acknowledge systemic racism and take action to Question. achieve equitable outcomes for all. Minister, can you please outline the steps that our government has taken to combat ra systemic racism in Ontario? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member for the question, and especially on this important day. Mr. Speaker, systemic racism is real, and it creates unfair outcomes for people here in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity to travel across this great province, and I spoke to many people. I spoke to them about the painful realities of racism. And I want to take a moment to thank the people that came out because I know those conversations were tough and they were very painful, and it wasn't an easy thing for people to do. Many of these conversations were frustrating and they were difficult. But Mr. Speaker, we listened to people's stories, we listened to ideas, and we've taken those ideas and we've brought a strategy forward that I think we all could be proud of. Mr. Speaker, on March 7th, our government introduced the Better Way Forward, a three-year strategic plan to fight, anti to fight racism here in the province of Ontario, and to really build an anti-racism approach to the way the government does things. And I'm very proud to be here today to talk Thank about you. that strategy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response and your work in our communities. I'm proud to see that our government has put forward a plan to address systemic racism. This is much needed, and I know that there will be many constituents in my riding of Kingston and the Islands who appreciate and support this work. Speaker, we know that communities face deep histories and legacies of marginalization that continue to shape outcomes today. Research shows that some populations, particularly Indigenous people, face systemic racism and disproportionately worse socioeconomic outcomes compared to others. We know, for example, that Black and Indigenous people are overrepresented in the child welfare and justice systems. Minister, can you tell us how this plan will combat sure. racism in our public institutions? Well, thank you again for the question. Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge the Minister of Education, the Attorney General, the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, the Minister responsible for Indigenous Relations and Reconciliations, and many other ministers and members on this side of the House for being there and to build, help to build this plan. We're taking a whole-of-government whole approach to build a plan that will fight uh, racial disparities here in the province of Ontario. And the Anti-Racism Directorate will partner with ministries to pilot and collect disaggregated data. Uh, in child welfare, justice, and in education. So, Mr. Speaker, we have a three-year plan, and that strategic plan includes and attempts to reduce disparities and disproportionalities affecting Indigenous and racialized people in government policies, programs, and services. It also looks to ensure sustainability and accountability, yes, increase education and public awareness and systemic racism, and work collectively with communities to eliminate systemic racism. Thank you. Question, the member from Lampton Kent, the member from Leeds, Grenville. Speaker, for 47 years, Swan's variety was a landmark in the village of Athens. Swan survived a major fire and lasted through the terms of eight premiers, but not the ninth. On Friday, a heartbroken owner, Karen Swan, turned out the lights for the last time. It wasn't a lack of customers that spelled the end for Swan's. It was the crippling cost of hydro culminating in last month's outrageous $7,000 bill. 
The Premier diminishes the hydro crisis and energy poverty she created by calling it a mistake. Speaker, what does the Premier have to say to Karen Swan, who just paid for this mistake with her family business? Well, Mr. Speaker, again, I don't, I don't know the circumstances around this business. What I do know is that there are small businesses all over the province, Mr. Speaker, who are going to see a 25 per cent reduction this summer, Mr. Speaker, because we know, we know that it's not just individuals or families in their homes who have been carrying a, a burden, Mr. Speaker, and, and as, as we have said, have been asked to pay for upgrades to a system that had been neglected. Had... My resolve still exists. That's just a simple reminder. If it continues, we'll move right along. Finish, please. have been asked to pay for improvements in the system, Mr. Speaker, that will last for many, many years, which is why we're spreading the cost of those over a longer period of time, Mr. Speaker. Again, I don't know the specific circumstances around this business, but we, we understand very clearly that businesses, small businesses, mom-and-pop businesses on, in towns around the province need Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Speaker, for years, the Premier ignored our warnings. Yeah that unaffordable hydro rates were destroying our communities. Now, when her political future is at stake, she suddenly claims to care. Yeah. They shamelessly spend taxpayer dollars on ads designed to portray themselves as heroes in a disaster they created. But if she stops patting herself on the back and looks around, she'll see that no one's buying it. Ontarians will never forget this Premier did nothing as hydro rates soared business closed, and families were forced from their homes. Yep. Speaker, will the Premier admit that it was her failed leadership on the hydro crisis that cost Karen Swan everything she had? Mr. Of Energy. Mr. Of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I know the uh, honourable member used the word disaster, and that was the electricity grid that they left for us, Mr. Speaker. They left the province and the electricity grid in a disaster, Mr. Speaker. We had rolling brownouts on a regular basis, a blackout, Mr. Speaker. So we acted. This government, this party acted and made sure that we rebuilt the system, Mr. Speaker. Rebuilt generation, rebuilt transmission, rebuilt distribution, Mr. Speaker. That was needed to ensure that all businesses in this province, that all families in this province were able to keep the lights on, Mr. Speaker. And now, now, Mr. Speaker, we're making sure that we're reducing those bills by 25 per cent, Mr. Speaker, for small businesses, for farms, yes, and sir. for families right across the province. And let's not forget 40 to 50 per cent reduction for those folks in Hydro One customers. Thank you. New question, the member from Timmins James Bay. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, I have a situation that proves that privatization is a disaster. Your government went and privatized the delivery of internet services and long distance in northeastern Ontario when you privatized Ontario. Now what happens, I get phone calls from constituents like Bill Waitchison and Timmins, who ended up losing his Ontario service that had very high speed internet up and down so that he could do what he had to do. He was forced to go to the private sector with Bell to purchase internet service. The cost went up by 50 per cent and his service went down with lower bandwidth. Will you finally admit that privatization of public services is a bad thing? Thank you. Senior. 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 Very much. I want to uh, thank the member for the question. What, what I know about the file is simply this, Speaker. In October uh, 2014, the province and the board completed the sale of Ontario uh, to Bell Alliant, which is now Bell Canada. The reality is that over the past decade, Ontario was not able to generate sufficient revenues to, co to, uh, to cover its operating and capital expenses. Speaker, the, the government had external financial experts look at ONTC's books and evaluate the cost of keeping Ontario in public hands. They found that keeping Ontario was going to cost about $148 million in the long term and that by selling it, we could actually save Speaker $96 million. The cost to the ONTC of continuing to own Ontario was greater than the short-term cost associated with the sale, Speaker, and I look forward yes, to providing more information in the supplementary. Minister, what hogwash! 
Ontario was set up for the reason that there isn't a large enough market for the private sector to deliver the service needed. So that's why the Ontario government stepped in with Ontario, so that people in places like Timmins and people in Iroquois Falls and other communities are able to get the internet. Instead, you decided to leave them to the avails of the market, which the market is not large enough, and now we're forced to pay more to get less service. So will you finally admit privatizing Ontario was a mistake? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. There's been tremendous changes in the telecom industry, and it no longer made sense for ONTC to run a telecom company whose services are being provided more efficiently by private sector companies. The sale of Ontario is part of the government's strategic path forward. We've committed $15 million investment that will be matched dollar for dollar by Bell and will result in a $30 million update to fibre network systems and tower and system upgrades. While there were short-term costs associated with the sale of Ontario, the costs of continued ownership Thank you. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. While there were short-term costs associated with the sale, the costs of continued ownership outweighed the short-term costs of the sale. Proceeds from the sale include $6 million in cash and yes, an sir. estimated $9 million in long-term revenue to the ONTC through a fiber license agreement with Bell. Thank, Thank you. you. Your question, the member from Kitchener Second. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Well, we've been seeing phenomenal reviews of Come From Away, a musical that made its debut on Broadway this month after being showcased here in Toronto. The musical tells a story of Canadians helping stranded American travellers in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Speaker, this show actually got its start here in Ontario with the collaboration of Sheridan College. Speaker, could the minister please tell us more about this musical and how Sheridan was involved in bringing it to Broadway? The Minister of Education, Advanced Skills, Thank and Minister Responsible for Digital Government. I to have this question and this opportunity to highlight an extraordinary success from one of our colleges, Speaker. Last week, I was delighted to be uh, in New York City, uh, see come from away on Broadway, Speaker. As the member said, it's how the people of Gander, Newfoundland came together to support people from all over the world as they landed there after 9-11. It's received fantastic critical acclaim. A-listers are going to see it. Maybe none more uh, famous speaker than our very own Minister of Labour, Kevin Flynn, attending uh, as well. Speaker, it is heartwarming. It is compelling. It's a show set in Canada, written by Canadians Irene Sankoff and David Hine. It was born and brought to life right here in Ontario through the Sheridan College Canadian Musical Theatre Project. Speaker, I'm delighted to talk more than my supplementary. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for her answer, and I think we're all quite envious of our labour minister for taking in the show. We're going to ask him all about it. Uh, we should note that Sheridan works with the Canadian Musical Theatre Project as a kind of musical theatre incubator. Canadian and international writers and composers can bring their new musicals to life through workshops and staged readings, working with a cast of students. Speaker, could the minister please tell us more on how students are involved in the creation of musicals like Come From Away? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Since 2011, the Canadian Musical Theatre Project uh, has worked uh, workshop 12 musicals this way. Led by Michael Rubinoff, students are involved from the very beginning, helping shape these pieces of art through each new stage of development. And this is exactly the kind of hands-on experiential learning we want all students to have, whether they're in engineering, whether they're in early childhood education or performance arts. Colleges have been leaders in integrating this type of high-impact opportunity for students right into their learning. Next, week's, or next month, we'll be celebrating Colleges Week, a celebration of the 50th anniversary of Ontario's public college system. And there is a lot to celebrate. Come From Away is yes, one example, Speaker, where colleges are making our lives here better in Ontario and also bringing us pride Thank on you. the world stage. 
question, the member from Lansing, Kent, Middlesex. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Premier. Last week, I held my second Rural and Small Town Poverty and Jobs Roundtable. One of the major topics at this meeting was the soaring hydro costs and how devastating they've been to people in small towns. Speaker, I don't need to tell the Premier of Ontario that electricity rates have more than doubled in recent years, driving people into energy poverty. Yet no action was taken until her popularity in the polls plummeted. And even then, her first step was to use taxpayers' money to create congratulatory ads. Speaker, will the Premier explain why it is more important to put out a series of partisan political ads than it is to actually fix a hydro crisis that her government has created? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to rise and talk about the Ontario Fair Hydro Plan, which actually addresses the specific issues concerned by many families that live in the rural or northern parts of our province, Mr. Speaker. And because of that, Mr. Speaker, we acted. And so the triple RP is going to be increased, Mr. Speaker, significantly for many of those customers who are R2 customers or R1 customers, Mr. Speaker. They're actually going to see not just 25 percent, Mr. Speaker, like every other family and small business and farm in the province, they're actually going to see between 40 and 50 percent reductions, Mr. Speaker, for those folks that are in rural and in, in northern parts of, of the province. And so, Mr. Speaker, we're going to make sure that the triple RP is enhanced. We're making sure that distribution rates are fair for those folks that are in those parts of our province, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to bring That's forward right. other programs like the Affordability Fund that will also help those folks in, in that part of the Thank province, you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Speaker, and back to the Premier. One of the many attendees at my recent roundtable was Pastor Brian Horobin of the First Baptist Church in Wallaceburg. Pastor Horobin stated that Ontario's soaring electricity prices are emptying the charitable coffers of churches that are being tapped by parishioners unable to pay their power bills or afford groceries. Another story of heat or eat here in Liberal Ontario. Speaker, does the Premier think it's fair for people to rely on churches to cover basic necessities like heat, hydro and groceries in their communities, or does she simply not care about the people living in small towns in rural Ontario who are stuck paying their bills? She doesn't care. Minister. Minister of Poverty and Housing. Minister of Housing responsible for poverty reduction. Well, thank you, Speaker, and, and, and delighted to be able to follow up uh, on the discussion around poverty in Ontario. And I think it shows the leadership of this government in establishing a ministry that focuses on Ontario's uh, poverty reduction strategy. I want to let you know that uh, yesterday uh, we tabled with the legislature our our poverty reduction strategy report, Mr. Wow. Speaker. That that announces we've had a 20 percent reduction in child poverty in this province. So I think that shows great leadership right across. The, right across. Mr. Speaker, there's so much more that uh, this province is doing when it comes to poverty reduction in general, whether it be things like the free tuition for students, for uh, uh, the yes, basic sir. income pilot that we're offering, uh, the, uh, the energy costs with, uh, with some of the strategies that we're, we're undertaking. But by and large, Thank Mr. You. Speaker, we're focused on poverty. Thank you. Your question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. A local business, Border City Casting from Fort Erie, contacted our office regarding a recent hydro bill. It was $12,000. Wow. Yes, $12,000. This local business actually only used around $1,000 in electricity. But between global adjustment charges, delivery charges and HST, the bill is $12,000. Wow. Well, I appreciate that there is an 8% discount to help businesses in Ontario. Unfortunately, this business does not qualify for that reduction. Because of their kilowatts per hour usage, they don't qualify. Mr. Speaker, I believe this is unfair. The Liberal government should be concerned that businesses in Niagara and across Ontario are going to have to close because of these policies. Question. So I ask the Premier, will you commit to taking immediate action to help small and medium-sized businesses in Ontario with their crushing hydro bills by stopping the sale of hydro wine Thank you. and taking real action to lower hydro bills? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's very important to note that the ICI program, Mr. Speaker, actually helps 
all businesses within um, you know under a megawatt of power usage mr. speaker with reducing their bills by up to a third and I don't know the specifics of that uh, individual business and I'd be more than happy to talk with the honorable member about that to find out what programs they do qualify for mr. speaker because there are many many programs that are out there mr. speaker I was at a great company in Brant mr. speaker called hematite we were there uh, giving them uh, an award they saved two hundred thousand dollars mr. speaker wow. by changing their lights mr. speaker but you know what they were unaware of the ICI program so we're working with them to actually help them save a third on their bills mr. speaker and the way we've dropped this mr. speaker the way we reduce this from one megawatt Answer. to 500 kilowatts thousands of more small businesses and medium-sized enterprises will qualify for the ICI that's great Thank news you. for business in this province mr. speaker time for question period is over a member from London Fanshawe at a point of order uh, yes, Speaker. I'd like to correct my record. Rather than 10 decades, it's only 10 years, but it feels like 10 decades. <laughs> <laughs> Members are always allowed to uh, correct their record uh, w without editorial. Um, the member from uh, Ajax Pickering on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, with your indulgence, I would like to, on behalf of all three parties, invite everyone here today to a special uh, Down Syndrome Association of Ontario in room, committee room 228, and uh, that will be underway three minutes ago and will be going for an hour and a half. We look you have to my indulgence. Thank you. It's not a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. The, uh, member, the Minister of Health, Long-Term Care and Point of Order. I apologize. When I was uh, responding to the question on uh, hospital operating budgets, I referenced Hamilton Health Sciences. I had intended, in fact, to reference St. Joseph's health care system that received a $15 million uh, increase in operations last year. Absolutely never too late to have someone asked to stop. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed till 3 p.m. this afternoon.